John Rubino is the former founder of the dollarcollapse.com. He's also an author of several books about the end of our financial regime. He speaks widely to audiences on this topic, and he's here with us again this Wednesday, November 30th, 2022. John, thanks for coming back on Liberty and Finance. Hey, Dunnigan. Good to talk to you again. It's been a while since you and I were here personally together. Glad to have you back in this way. And uh, there's so much to talk about. We're going to have to be a bit selective in our topics because the the um, the drumbeat of unprecedented and horrible things. <laughs> I remember when I met you in person at the Liberty Mastermind Symposium. I believe it was Dallas, Texas. And uh, you were on the stage there talking about uh, how there's a myriad of things that could go wrong and any one of them could start a chain reaction and bring the whole house of cards down. There's certainly been a lot of uh, chewing gum and glue and bungee cords that have been used since then to try to keep the house of cards intact as much as possible. But there are signs now that your latest research is uh, unearthing of a dramatic and drastic slowdowns in the U.S. economy. Can you talk to us about what we know? Uh, Yeah, Uh, we're we're in kind of a regime change now where the past year has been kind of an inflationary boom, you know, too fast growth, uh, too quickly rising prices. And now that's all starting to reverse. Um, The most recent stat is the Chicago Purchasing Managers Index, which is a um, measure of um, industrial activity in the Midwest. And it tanked, you know, it was expected to be bad. It was it was much worse in reality. And it's at. the worst level since the um, uh, the pandemic started, you know, which was a we had a really short, sharp um, recession then, and it's that bad right now. So that, along with a whole bunch of other stats like housing tanking and um, you know, mass layoffs in um, the tech sector, those things all point towards a dramatically sh- slowing economy, which is going to um, take inflation off the table as a, a serious concern. It's, it's completely possible that by this time next year. We're worried about deflation, um, which means there are going to be a lot of changes in the uh, the government's response to what's going on in the world. That's been so bewildering to most people. Uh, most people have been feeling the loss of purchasing power over decades, and especially the last several years, just like a hockey stick in the last two years. Um, if, in a def- if there's a shift, as you call it, a regime change from an inflationary to a deflationary environment, um, can you walk us through major, maybe some major impacts, how people will see this hitting them and where they need to position themselves to be ahead of that? Well, it, um, it depends on what it is that goes down in price. Uh, you know, some things will continue to go up, like food is, um, that's a supply chain issue. Food prices are, are going to be tight for quite a while. Um, and maybe natural gas, because that's another supply chain issue. But, uh, you know, oil is down lately and, and house prices are falling and car prices are falling. So it, it um, your your sense of what's happening to your own lifestyle is going to depend on what you're trying to buy at any given time. You know, food will still be expensive, but it might be cheaper to put gas in the car. Uh, if you're trying to sell a house, then uh, you're going to feel deflation really um, um severely because the uh, the price that you're going to be able to get for your house is going to go down dramatically. So it's going to be messy. But on balance, it's not going to feel like a, an across the board inflationary boom anymore. It's going to feel like an economy tipping into recession with a lot of things getting cheaper. But it, you know, it's not going to be pleasant because, yes, you're a consumer and, and maybe you're not paying as much to um, um, to live anymore. But your job is going to be a lot um, less secure and uh, those of you, the rest of your family will be the same way. Uh, so life will get a lot harder. And, uh, you know, the, the bottom line to all this is that uh, the, uh, the central bank tightening that we're seeing right now is going to be reversed out pretty dramatically at some point. So the, uh, the pivot that everybody's looking for, we already heard a little bit of that today, by the way. The, um, the, this is Wednesday. And the chairman of the Fed uh, gave a talk in which he predicted smaller rate increases going forward. So that's the first step. You know, the, na- the one after that is a cessation of rate increases and then rate cuts. And then we'll be back in the, you know, the familiar world of extremely easy money um, or easier money with the Fed leading the way. So, uh, uh, yeah, you know, the, the next year will be a huge change, but it's going to be um, a very scary time because it's not clear that the um, 
the global economy, as leveraged as it is, can handle another garden variety recession. You know, it might turn into something much worse just because so many leveraged players are going to blow up out there. And uh, we can go through some of the uh, the likely suspects if you want. Well, that's one of the concerns that a lot of our clients have is that they're calling and saying they're not comfortable with the stability of the banking system. We've certainly had uh, people such as Alistair McLeod, whom you know well, uh, talking about the leverage pot position of many of the banks and, and the fragility and the low uh, book to uh, asset value ratio of, of a lot of those of those banks versus the market price and. And it seems to indicate a fragility in the banking system in general uh, that has some worst case spots where there might be the first dominoes to fall. Can you talk to us about where the real trouble spots appear to be? Yeah, I'd be paying attention to Credit Suisse right now. It's a big European bank that is just on the verge of imploding. Its stock price has tanked. It's trying to raise new capital at this incredibly low um, valuation, which is a, a sign of a company in serious trouble because nobody in their right mind would uh, would raise capital when they're trading at a fraction of their book value. Um, and their credit default swaps on their bonds are, are becoming more and more expensive now, which is a sign that the market is worried about a default. Um, so let's say Credit Suisse implodes in the next few months. What does that do? Well, everybody starts looking for the next one. And Deutsche Bank is the obvious uh, next candidate. And, you know, these are big financial institutions. You let those two get into trouble. And that's kind of a layman moment or a potential layman moment. In other words, are we going to let these gigantic institutions go bust with all the um, the other dominoes that would fall afterwards? You know, because that, that might be the thing that starts a cascade failure of the financial system. Or do we bail them out at the cost of, of the creation of, um, you know, hundreds of billions or maybe trillions of new euros? Um, and dollars, because the Fed will chip in for sure, um, at, with which risks tanking the currencies of the countries doing the bailouts. So we get into a very dicey period there where every decision carries huge risks and nobody knows what to do for sure. You know, that's a that, that's a recipe for risk off in the financial markets. Everybody's going to be worried because they don't know what's going to happen. So they pull in their horns, you know, they, they, they lower risk as much as possible, which is to say they sell the riskier assets on their their balance sheets. Um, so you, you get the potential for some very serious knock on effects if something like Credit Suisse actually does implode. And it looks like it's going to here. Well, as long as you're mentioning uh, Deutsche Bank as well, uh, people have been saying for a long time, for years, that Germany is the the, the engine, the powerhouse of the European economy. So for the whole Eurozone, you know, Germany's been the little engine that could to keep pulling it up the, up the hill, uh, despite the drag from countries like, well, some of the Mediterranean countries, uh, Italy, Spain, Greece, etc. And uh, what's your view, since you're mentioning recession coming of uh, the the status of Germany in particular, or Europe in 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 a broader sense, uh, participating in this recession that you see ahead. Well, yeah, the the reason the eurozone has been able to hang together as an economic and financial entity is because um, if you're buying, say, Italian bonds, you're not betting on Italy. You're assuming that the European Central Bank will back up Italian bonds, and you're assuming that Germany backs up the, the ECB, right? So basically, you're buying German bonds when you buy Italian bonds. Uh, that's basically the only thing that's allowed a lot of the weaker Eurozone countries to continue to exist in, in their current forms, because they're borrowing huge amounts of money, but nobody would lend to them unless Germany was ultimately backing them up. Now, Germany... Um, has screwed up their energy system so completely that it's not clear that they're a, um, a completely viable economy anymore because, uh, you know, they're, they're a manufacturing powerhouse, but the way they manufacture is basically to import cheap natural gas and turn that natural gas into um, products. Now, I'm oversimplifying, but only by a little bit, you know, and, and because they um, they contracted for a huge amount of natural gas from Russia and then proceeded to antagonize Russia into um, cutting off those supplies. I'm also oversimplifying here, but um, the gist of it is, is true. Um, it's not clear that Germany's industrial base is still functional. You know, So the next couple of years, they may not be the industrial powerhouse that we expected. 
uh, which means not just a recession in Europe. It means the deindustrialization of Europe, which is a whole different animal and, and potentially a lot more dangerous financially. So that's what they're looking at, you know, and we'll, we'll see how winter goes. So far, they've had a um, relatively warm winter which has bought them a little bit of time, but it's not clear they're gonna have enough natural gas to keep factories running and keep homes heated. And if not this year, um, next year is gonna be the, uh, uh, the decision point. So, you know, Europe is, uh, is in a mess on a lot of different levels and it's not clear how they get out of this mess.